I think it's valuable to take an aerial view of the importance of the work overall, across all disciplines, in the context in which we find ourselves right now, this year, in this country. I think, I would argue to you all, the biggest single challenge facing the future of the country, at a local level, at a state level, and for the nation as a whole, is not the risk of another banking crisis, which would be bad, is not the possibility of a double-dip recession, which would be terrible, is not ISIS, although ISIS is scary. It's what to do as a civilized people to thoughtfully deal with what now is a continuing 40 to 45 year trend of civic deterioration, civic withdrawal. A growing majority of Americans are finding themselves raising families, interacting at a personal level with people unlike themselves at lower and lower levels. They've had less interpersonal, visceral human connections with families going through stories unlike their own than any generation we can measure for the last 50 years. At a fundamental building block level, at a fundamental core definition of what it means to be a thoughtful citizen in an increasingly complicated world, where there are very few issues that matter to anyone that don't have at their core nuance and complexity, at the core of being able to have a chance to be good at this is compassion and empathy. And fortunately for us all, those are human abilities that are within us all. But it's up to us as citizens, it's up to us as educators of the next generation to determine whether we put in place mechanisms that help human beings develop those abilities. Because they can atrophy the way an arm and a cast can, or they can flourish. And for far too many Americans, they atrophy with a lack of personal connectedness to families and stories unlike our own. Well, if you have a growing segment of the population attending colleges that have no personal relationships or insights into the majority of families with children who will never go to college, the human nature instinct is to categorize them and label them with six or seven words and get on with your day. That's poisonous to the future of the nation. It's poisonous for our ability to be thoughtful citizens figuring out very complicated issues that affect other human beings. You are working with students who, by the middle of their junior year in Florida, are better educated than 70% of the state. There are students that are in college who quickly come to feel the culture and the story they're in as average. That's what it is. This is sort of average. People my age, 22-year-olds. Some are smarter than me, some are richer, but this is kind of, there's nothing average about college in America. And no one is in a better position to participate in progress addressing these meaningful issues than college-educated Americans and colleges themselves. And I started getting fascinated with the core idea of how do we as Americans define what it means to be an obligated human being? Who tells that story? How does someone know if they're doing enough to be a good person? And at the time, maybe 18, 19 years ago, there started to be a really thoughtful pedagogical battle in higher education across the country, and education leaders standing up and moving forward and saying, we have to do more. It can't just be occasional service from the campuses. It can't just be the third word on the pillar outside the front of the campus where we occasionally help out at a soup kitchen. We're creating the next generation of leaders in the country, and they're less and less connected to anyone unlike themselves it needs to become a fundamental part of what it means to achieve a degree in higher education, a connectedness. What if the story was introduced big? What if you stood back and created an infrastructure to redefine service learning and campus engagement across a whole state? About 18 years ago, technology revolutionizes vision care capabilities. Portable cameras that have only gotten better that take pictures of children's eyes can diagnose a vision problem before the kid can read an eye chart. No state comprehensively provides vision care to children before public school because you can't find them in very big numbers. It's a mess. You've got to go to daycare centers. It's a hassle. It's a lot more expensive and time-consuming 
So most states, all states, wait till public school, and some do a good job and some do a bad job. But the majority of vision problems, which is 10% of the population, are there by age two. So the children blessed to be born into the suburbs of America who see pediatricians regularly often have it caught early before they fall behind in reading. For the majority of children in America who don't see pediatricians regularly, for the majority of children in the South who never see pediatricians, it doesn't get caught. And children never self-diagnose a vision problem. We literally find children with cataracts who are walking into things have no idea they're not seeing better, they're seeing worse than other kids. That's their perspective, they don't know. And they get labeled slow or attention deficit disorder, sometimes just dumb. And they're falling behind in reading and they're frustrated and someone just needs to check their vision. And I had this meeting with the dean of the School of Ophthalmology after all the research I could do, the final meeting. And I said, is it really that valuable? If I can figure out a way to empower college students if we start getting to thousands of two and three year olds in remote, rural, small daycare centers, a lot of which are in trailers, is that really going to be valuable? Because most of those kids are going to be screened at about six or seven. And this guy leans forward and he puts his glasses down. This is like a cheesy made for TV movie scene. <laughs> and he said, Stephen, those kids from that six year old screening, they come here every year. We get, we get hundreds of them in to UAB from around the state with amblyopia sometimes cataracts, nerve, muscle problems. When one eye is working terribly worse than the other, your brain starts to shut it down at about age two. And they come in at six or seven, we do what we've done for 50 years, which is patch the dominant eye, prescribe the right glasses. Sometimes there's a procedure, but usually it's a patch. You see the kid gets teased, it's hard on the parents, but if that family is focused and disciplined, we can usually have it on there for about six months, and we usually get the vision back to about 40, 45%. And he leaned forward and he said, if you bring me that child when he's two and a half, I can patch him for two weeks and have it 100%. And I said, well, I won't tell you what I said because I swore. <laughs> can I swear? I, almost, I, said, I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and, he said, and he said, no. And I said, well, why aren't we doing that? And he said, who's going to go find them? And I thought, even though I'm a lawyer, I thought, that's what I'm in Alabama to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell this story in a way that will bring people into it, and that's what we're going to do. And that was the first year, and we got to 4,600 kids in a partnership with three universities. And now every year, including this last year, we get to over 37,000 preschoolers in 1,100 low-income daycare centers across all 67 counties of the state. We have college students waking up at 6 o'clock in the morning, picking up that $4,000 camera, driving it to a daycare center down a dirt road that you can't find on MapQuest, and they set that thing up in the living room of a trailer, and they take pictures of those children's eyes because they believe in their heart that you can debate about health care in the afternoon, but if you have the ability to end a health care problem across a state in the mornings at a, as a 21-year-old, you can damn well roll your sleeves up and do it. But also, we're now a state that's known as the best early vision initiative in the nation, and the whole thing is run out of campuses as a service learning initiative. This was not hard to get students engaged in being the one that finds blindness. What about service learning in the context of bigger issues? What about, I've been reading, what about the risk of growing a generation of volunteers, the millennials, the most charitable volunteeristic generation we've ever created, who are yet pretty self-absorbed and self-celebratory in their service and are much more likely to want to do service that ends by 6 p.m. with 30 pictures that they can post for the next month. <laughs> nothing wrong with service, nothing wrong with one-day service projects. But if it creates a generation celebrating their efficacy just in terms of volunteerism and not with any consideration for injustice or structural change, are we even addressing the problem? So the founder of Habitat for Humanity, that he believed in the wealthiest, most technologically advanced nation in the history of the world to have the inadequate supply of safe, affordable housing for low-income working families was functionally immoral. And so he starts Habitat for Humanity. But 25 years later, he becomes increasingly anxious and starts to have a hard time sleeping because of the difference between charity and justice, which to me is the difference between service and service learning. 
he started to realize that he had told the story in a way that engaged millions of Americans in the problem, but he had also created the story in a way that let millions of Americans feel as though they had met their obligation to the problem by helping out on a weekend. And by 6 p.m. they could be home on their couch drinking a beer, feeling to themselves, of course I care about the struggle for low-income families to have housing. I helped out on a damn Habitat for Humanity build. What did you do today? And yet, as he said, take a snapshot of the problem that created the situation where I started the initiative 30 years ago, fast forward 30 years, look at it now, it's worse than it was before I started it. Not only is the problem not better, it's worse. And yet I've created a generation of churchgoers and college students who feel as though they're nobly addressing the problem. And he starts a housing policy center, which to me in our world is the way of saying a Habitat for Humanity build is valuable, but it's tenfold more valuable if it's tied to a course where the students are reflecting on their service and thinking about Hope Six grants and, hope, and affordable housing and thinking about missed turns where public housing were built in Chicago 29 stories high with cement structures where you couldn't see sunlight between story three and eight. And for 12 of the stories, you smelled urine. And that was the answer to address poverty and to sit students down regardless of their major, regardless of what their professional career ambitions are, but to learn as citizens things we should all know about how to move forward in this problem. And it can't just be met by being a charitable volunteer at a Habitat build on a Saturday. And that difference is on us. That's on us as university enablers, as storytellers of what it means to be a good person. I love it when our students volunteer, but it's not enough.